Okay, um, for those of you who don't know who I am, my name's Oliver Jones, I'm senior developer at Itty Bitty Apps, working for Sean. Um, you can find me on the, the interwebs at imorj.com or ORJ on Twitter and all the other online services I can get that, um, that handle for. Um, what I am going to be talking about is metaprogramming with X macros now or how I learned to stop worrying and love the preprocessor. Um, metaprogramming is kind of a highfalutin name um, for what I'm going to show you. Uh, metaprogramming has connotations of you know, really hardcore C++ template programming. Um, Ruby. Ruby with DSLs and, and all that sort of. It's a hip thing to do. Um, this talk is really metaprogramming for two-year-olds um, because it's not that complex what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm no template or even preprocessor guru, but um, anyway, uh, stuff. What, uh, it, probably all of you use and are familiar with the preprocessor in languages like C and Objective-C and C++, um, but you may not actually know what exactly it is and you may be unaware of uh, some of its features. Um, the preprocessor is part of the standard C library, well, the C stand, well, so C and C++ standards. Uh, it, m most compilers have extensions to the preprocessor. Um, even the Objective-C, I don't know if Objective-C is standardized, actually, but um, it adds the import um, operator to the preprocessor. Uh, and that um, directive, well, rather than operator, that directive is, is actually very different on platforms like Windows where uh, Microsoft use it for importing com type libraries. Um, so that may not be, that's not part of the standard um, uh, C99 or C11 standard. Okay, um, once upon a time it was a, a, a separate process from the compiler. Um, basically, your toolchain, um, if, you like, if you're invoking the compiler, it would subprocess out to the preprocessor, pipe all of your .m file, your .c file into it, and then pipe out the output of the preprocessor into the actual compiler. Um, these, in this day and age, um, compilers like Clang actually build it into the parser and Lexer, um, the sort of AST generation of the uh, compiler stage. Um, it is in fact a macro language, um, so it's not just for going include this file. Um, or if defined this code, else this code, uh, which is probably uh, the 80% case that most people use it for. Um, and it is also Turing complete. Um, for those of you who didn't study computer science or forgotten it, uh, Turing complete means, uh, well, this is the Wikipedia definition, but <laughs> um, what it basically means is it's a complete programming language. It, it has flow control. Um, it can uh, do loops and um, all sorts of things. I mean, there's some pretty hysterical examples on the internet of doing things like delaying your compiler by um, just getting it to spin cycles and things. But anyway, um, this is an example um, of some slightly crazy uh, metaprogramming in a preprocessor. Um, this is the smallest example uh, of the boost from the boost preprocessor library documentation, uh, and it's a full, complete example of what of of something that's actually generating code. Um, this is a DUFS device. I don't know if anyone's familiar with what a DUFS device is, but basically, a DUFS device is a um, it's an optimization loop unrolling optimization. Um, it was historically or typically done um, in assembly or in C languages to uh, speed up the uh, writing of data out to memory map ports. But anyway, it's a, a loop unrolling technique and if you were to use it, you'd have to write a whole bunch of code using a switch statement, which is like case zero, case one, case two, case three. Um, and this, what this um, example is doing is actually using the preprocessor to write all that code for you and let you parameterize how much your loop gets unrolled. But you don't have to read or understand that because we're not going into that much depth. Um, if you do want to do some pretty crazy stuff, um, then I highly recommend you look uh, at the Boost library. Um, it's probably the most complete and powerful uh, preprocessor metaprogramming library out there. Um, 
and of course, you know, it's it's also targeted at C++ programmers, but you can use it in a um, Objective C uh, program if you needed to. Um, anyway, so for what I'm going to talk about, this is all you need to know. Well, there's a couple of slides of all you need to know. Um, first of all, there's two different types of macro uh, in the preprocessor. There's object-like macros, which are basically just I've got this and I want to replace it with this other thing. And that, so here I've got identifier and replacement list. That replacement list can be just arbitrary text. It's just whatever you like. The other type of macro is a function type um, like macro where you have an identifier which takes parameters or an argument list. Um, and that argument list can be um, arbitrarily long uh, with predefined name, um, argument names, or it can be actually in um, more modern compilers of variable argument lists. So just you know, dot, 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 and you can put as much as you like in there. Um, and then on the replacement list side of things, again, it can be just arbitrary text. Um, and in the uh, function-like uh, macros, any of the identifiers you put in your arguments list will be substituted in in the replacement list. Uh, so in this case, any, exist any occurrence of A1, A2, A3, or AN would be replaced uh, in the replacement list. Um, there are some rules around that, um, so uh, it has to be like a, a it has to be a symbol-like identifier. So it can't be just random against another word. So it couldn't be it wouldn't replace um, if you had the replacement list was a a a one, it wouldn't replace that or the end of that with your macro. Um, you would have to have white space in front of it or some other um, uh, thing that would delineate it as being a, a symbol. But uh, other than that, the only other rules are. Um, what you put in your arguments can't be a comma, and it can't be a parentheses, or either either left or right parentheses. Uh, but you can work around that. You can get commas in there by enclosing anything in a parenthesis, a set of parentheses. So you can have, for the A1 example there, you could put a bracket set and then put something comma something, and it would go in as the A1 argument. Um, the other things you need to know about are the stringify operator which is basically a way of turning arbitrary text into a string. Uh, so here in this example, I have, I've defined a macro stringify, it takes a single argument, and then you have hash a. And so what that is going to do is basically just enclose whatever the argument a is in quotes. And so in Objective-C, to get to be an Objective-C literal string, you're going to have the at, and so you put that in front of the macro. So it's just, uh, that is just plain text, it's already there, and then the string is put in afterwards by the string of my macro. Um, the second type uh, of operator is the concatenation operator. So in this case, it's very similar to the string file operator, except that it's not quoting things, it's le letting you butt your, your argument up against some arbitrary text. So in this case, I'm combining the words left and right with it to create the constant k left right. So k is just straight literal text, and then combine that with argument a, combine that with the argument b. All right, so what's an x macro? So this is, this is all an x macro is. It's not complex at all. Essentially, you define a, a macro, a replacement macro. In this case, we've got colors. And then it's arbitrary replacement text is after it. So we have x red, x blue, x thing. Now, the thing that makes it an x macro is not the x, though that is kind of why they named that. Um, it is that you are defining another function which is going to be interpolated by the macro, uh, by the preprocessor. So in this case, in this case, it's going to do something really dumb. It's just going to put something, something, something here. But um, you would, if you had this defined as whatever else, you could spit out something and take the parameter red or blue or green and write out some code. The, an alternative way of doing it is to use, instead of defining your x's as a, another macro, is to actually have a file, in this case colors def, which has each of the essentially data definitions defined on each line. And then as a convention, you can undefine x at the end of the file just to save you from having to do that every time you include it. 
which is down here. So here I define what x is going to be and then include um, the colors file. So you can imagine some scenarios that we might be able to, uh, to do. And so I'm just going to switch to Xcode and show you some, some examples. Yes, Xcode. The app code coder here. Um, I'm using Xcode is because you're familiar with it. <laughs> also because it works really well for this particular technique. And unfortunately, app code is not so good at it. Um, though I fired lots of bugs about it and they fixed a lot of them. Um, and you can get it to work in Xcode, it just requires a bit of jiggery pokery, which I didn't want to explain, but if anyone wants to know, I'm quite happy to share some of the um, extra magic. All right, so, um, kind of jumping ahead a little bit. First example I want to show you was to do with errors. Now, um, uh, so often in your app, right, you, you're writing your service layer or something and you want to define a set of custom errors uh, in your app and um, maybe you have your own error class which is subclassing in this error, probably not recommended, but say you just wanted to add a bunch of uh, category methods on uh, NS error, which you know factory up your your custom errors for your service layer. Okay, so in this case, I have three errors. I have the whoopsie error, the boo boo error, and the crap error. Uh, they have each got a name, obviously, uh, and they have an error code: 1000, 1001, 1002, and we have some error message. Um, and that error message is actually going to be the uh, localized string uh, dictionary, uh, localized string string lookup key. Anyway, so that's our errors. Now, there might be a number of things I want to do with my errors. I'd be, A, I want to generate them, and maybe I also want to be able to validate errors against my um, set of errors. So let's have a look at some of the code. So here I got my category on NS error. First thing I do, to find my error domain. Next, I want to have an enum of error codes. So Given my errors that I have my data file, my definition file, I define a macro that is it going to expand the name out to be org error code name. So, and I include my error set. So that's going to generate me an enum for uh, a set of enum items. Further down, I want uh, to have a bunch of vector methods. I want to have org whoops error and org crap error stuff like that. Um, and so that's going to, that macro there um, is going to generate the uh, function definitions. And if I go to the implementation, here we have the actual code generating the function, function implementation. So again, another macro definition, which this one's expanding out to actual full function, which I've broken out into multiple lines using the line continuation uh, character, a backslash. Um, and so that's just going to essentially generate out a bunch of um, methods that generate my NS error instances. Uh, and in this case, I'm using a helper method to actually uh, generate the, um, to create the object. So I often do this just to um, simplify the macro definition. Um, ma the problem with macros is that you get all, lose all the syntax highlighting and um, and stuff. You don't lose um, compiler error checking and stuff. The <coughs> Clang is very, very smart uh, at figuring out where you've screwed up and it'll show you exactly in the macro or whatever where it, it considers something to be wrong. Um, but in this case, just simplify that. And then the third method is a way of me checking whether or not an NS error is a known org error. Um, and so you hear, so you'll see I'm using the macro to generate a bunch of case statements. So, just quickly show you the preprocessor output. Go to the bottom. Come on. So, where are we? So here you'll see that's the actual generated code um, that the preprocessor has spat out for me, saving me from writing it all myself. Um, now, the benefit of this, of course, is I can just go back to the errors def file and just keep banging in errors. Um, I could have a whole bunch if I wanted to, and I wouldn't have to write any, extra, any more code um, to handle them or process them and stuff like that. 
So there we are, metaprogramming. Whew. Pretty complex. Anyway, go back to. Now, another example, which is almost semi canonical in the X macro world, is dealing with colors. So, or any enum really, it's like or anything you want to do. But here I've got out of the HTML, HTML standard all of the CSS colors that are predefined. So that's quite a lot, right? Um, and so in my NSQRL, NS color category I've written, I've got two little methods OIJ UI color with CSS name and OIJ CSS color for UI color. Uh, and I've got a couple of static helper methods there. Anyway. Go back to the code on or the implementation. So here we've got the implementation of this method. Um, I mostly need I need to look this data up somewhere. So I'm here. I'm just essentially generating all of the uh, dictionary literal members uh, for all the colors and sort of doing creating a mapping from. In this case, if we just uh, look at the uh, other file colors. So here I've got an integer, which is the uh, color in RGB and the name. So X and Y as parameters. Uh, and so here we've got Y, so the name mapped to the color and using my helper to generate a UI color from the integer. Uh, and, and then, I mean, the rest is pretty self-explanatory. It just looks it up and returns it. Otherwise, it returns nil if it doesn't find it. Um, and then the final method here it's a little bit more complex. Uh, it's sort of going the re doing the reverse. So here I just, again, using dispatch once to create a static dictionary uh, to take stringify. So you'll notice the stringify operator here. Stringifying the integer uh, and lower casing it to a stringified version of the name. So a string to string map. Uh, and then using core graphics basically to turn a UI color into a hex string and then look that up in the dictionary uh, and return uh, a color based on that uh, color name. Anyway, oh, sorry, it's the other way around. Taking a color and turning it into a name, sorry. <laughs> so yeah, so as you can see, like, I, could, I could do this differently. All right. This is a problem you could solve with a data file. You could put all these um, CSS colors in a, you know, in a plist, or you could put them in a JSON file, whatever you wanted to, and you would just load that data in at uh, you know at startup or um, in this, similar to this case on first use or something like that. Um, and that's a perfectly legitimate way of doing it. Uh, the downside to that uh, is that you have got to load and parse the file. So there's a little bit of performance hit. The other thing is if you're not using a, uh, something that's easily slurpable up, like JSON or plist, if you're just using a text file, you'd have to write a parser. You have to write some, something that actually um, parses that code up. Uh, and so that's just more shit you've got to do, more code you've got to write. Um, and here, you get kind of the same benefit, but instead of using your own brain to write a parser or using Apple's brain to write, um, slurp up things with plist, you use the compiler to generate the data for you. Uh, and the final example uh, is a little bit more complex. It's about using X macros to theme an app. Um, so I, I think I spoke to someone or posted on a mailing list about how I have in the past used um, X macros to provide theming support in an app, um, or at least to make it a little bit nicer when you are. Um, you know, when you're building your app and you've got a whole bunch of sort of common, common colors or common fonts or column, uh, common images or whatever, and you want to have, you want to use them all over your app, but you, you don't want to have to write that code every time, like, you know, UI color with whatever, or, you know, in this, um, UI image, image named, and then a string. Now, if you're using a um, cool compiler like, or a cool IDE like App Code, you know, it's going to give you a lot of autocomplete of your resources or whatever. It's going to make it um, easy for you to do that. Um, and of course, often the first sort of tool that people uh, pull off the, um, out of their toolbox uh, to do this and to share stuff is just to create a bunch of defines. They go define 
um, background color, you know, some UI color with white or whatever. Um, you know, this image, a common background image, this name, and so on. And so they're, throughout the code, they're scattering these uh, defined constants or, or what have you, either be it hash defines or static strings, whatever that they've defined as constants. Um, they're scattering it all throughout the code. And that's probably, as a first step, the best thing you can do. Um, and it works pretty well. It's a bit ugly, though. Um, what I'm going to do is a little bit more sophisticated, but it's roughly the same thing. It's just essentially creating a bunch of, of, um, of compile, compile time things that you can use. Um, anyway, so this example here, I've got just some normal hash defines, uh, so some colors, and then they're going to be replaced by this RGB text, and that isn't defined anywhere here yet, so that's um, a syntax error at the moment. Um, because RGB is not a function or anything that I've defined. Um, and then I've gone, okay, I'm going to create a color name, view background, it's going to be off-white. I've got hello world text and hello world text shadow and hello X macro is background and there's some colors there and I've got a font definition and an image and, and a label, which is a little bit interesting. And then as convention, I undef all the macros at the bottom. So what am I actually going to do with this thing? Wrong file. So. Given that data, uh, I now define RGB at the moment in the, in the header file to explain uh, to expand to nothing, um, and then I define color and font and image and label, and so they're going to generate some methods: color for name, font for name, image for name, and image one. Actually, it defines two methods: image view for name and image name, image for name, and then label for name with frame, and then so when I include the theme.def file there, it's going to generate all those methods for me based on how many times I've written, I've, I've defined colors and things in, in the colors .de, uh, in the theme.def file. So the implementation is basically the same as before and other examples, um, just sort of the, the .m file version of it. So we've got the actual implementation of each of these, you know, image, so color for name just returns the color that's provided. Uh, the image for named uh, image for name is you know, UI image name, image for name, um, image named. Image view takes call actually calls the other um, pre-created no, like auto-created code there um, to create an image view with an image. Uh, and font does the same sort of thing. And then label here actually calls this helper method a little bit further down, which uh, actually constructs up a label based on a sort of naming convention. So from the other file, you might have noticed I was using the common name for. Um, my text and text shadow and background and so on. Um, so when I define my label, it's obviously assuming that all of these things up here uh, exist. And, and so it'll break if they don't. Um, but you know, I could get more sophisticated with my macros if I wanted to make it so it was sort of like a, an arbitrary argument list or something, but I'm not I'm trying to melt anyone's brain today. Um, but it's perfectly, perfectly reasonable for you to create a macro that could, given based on its argument set, generate a completely custom uh, set of code with, um, and depending on that argument set, different you know bits that it was trying to call. So you would end up with a um, you would end up with actual custom factories based on um, sort of a simple definition in the in the theme defined file. But anyway, so what does this um, actually let me do? So here we've got an actual view controller that's using the code that's generated from this theme. Um, so here it's pretty simple, but you'll see I've now got on the OJ theme class a static method called color for view background. And you know that's fully autocomplete compliant, you know. Um, so it's it's gonna, you know, it's just gonna appear in my um, autocomplete. So you know if I'm bashing away at code, I can just go, you know, based on a class, in this case I've put everything on a theme class, in other cases in other um, apps that we've developed, we've actually put it on like uh, UI color, so you've got a category on UI color which is UI color, and then color for, this view controls background or something like that. So um, you have all of your stuff, all of your, uh, you know, theme definition essentially defined in one file or a set of files. Um, and it's easy to edit, and it's just going to generate all these symbols for you, 
or these methods that you can call. Um, and similarly, we have the label and um, the image view. So, I mean, this is just a, a very simple example of what you can do um, with using the power of your preprocessor. Um, we found uh, I found this to be quite useful um, as a, uh, a technique. It makes for fairly readable code. Um, you can also start really simply. Like uh, for one set of apps uh, we've done, we started with everything just defined in, in the def files. You know, all the colors and everything was just in here. But because this is generating code, you can change the implementation, right? So, you know, later on we wanted to maybe look that data up in a, in a, uh, in a bundle file, like plists or whatever. Just change the different, to a different implementation for, um, uh, in this class essentially, uh, you, you know, change the definition of the, of the macros. And you've gotten, a, a, you know, a different system, one that's reading from a file rather than out of the code generate, um, out of the code and the header files. Um, and so, yeah, it just it provides a little bit nicer. I mean, there's other systems, I mean, at REA and others, um, uh, a lot of the code for theming or for fetching resources and stuff is, is string-based. So it's, you know, get me the image named this thing out of the theme for this view or um, get me the color named um, this string. And the problem with that, of course, is that um, it's uh, really open to typos. Uh, so, or, and not even necessarily just type, typos, but also changing the data, the structure of the, of the uh, theme files. Like if you go and edit the data, that gets out of sync with the code. Uh, so you end up, you know, your app still builds and runs and everything, and then you click this button, it opens a view controller, can't find a resource, and the whole thing falls apart. Um, and so you don't find those errors and um, those problems until, uh, essentially t test time or run time. Uh, the benefit of using symbols or something that's defined and the, the compiler knows about um, is that it, it will fail at compile time. Like if you change, if you take, you know, if I remove one of the colors I define or whatever, um, it's not going to build and it's going to complain that um, it can't find color for hello x macros text shadow. Um, right there on the label uh, where it's used. Um, yeah, so it just sort of gives you a little bit more uh, sort of warning up front that something's going to go wrong. Um, and so, yeah, I, I quite like using this as a technique on, front, on the front of uh, theming systems if, uh, even if, you know, if we're using an underlying sort of file-based or data-based theming engine. Um, and of course, you can get as creative as you like. Um, like this, the max macro, what you generate or you, uh, in your class definition is entirely up to you. It um, doesn't have to be on a particular class. It can be a protocol, uh, which is then implemented by a particular class. Um, so you can have multiple switchable themes or um, all sorts of things, anything you like. Um, and that's it for the code demo. Um, and the final slide is just some links to things on the interwebs uh, for your reading pleasure. So got the Boost preprocessor library if you want to melt your head, uh, and the book chapter that helps explain it a little bit um, from a book on Boost. Uh, and of course, there's uh, Stack Overflow X Macro shenanigans and uh, a quite good introductory doc, Dr. Dobbs journal uh, for those old school C++ programmers. Um, but yeah, that's it, basically. Any questions? Yep. Um. One of the reasons we didn't use the preprocessor for that much complexity before is by its nature, being a preprocessor, you can't debug it afterwards when it becomes compiled and you're trying to debug it later, it's just not available. I don't know if Xcode is more right. smart built into it, but it's one of the issues of using preprocessing that much. Yeah, so the question is basically uh, can you debug um, your macros? And the short answer is no. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, Unfortunately, because of the way that line numbers work, you can cut. You can if you step into the assembly and stuff. But um, uh, yeah, the way that the the way that debugging information works is that it puts in it injects line numbers into your code, uh, and so that's how 
the debugger correlates between what source file you're looking at and, and um, so on. But those line numbers are actually injected by the preprocessor. Um, so uh, the, um, and when it's expanding macros, it doesn't introduce any more lines because they're supposed to correlate to the source, not the preprocessed source. So um, yeah, so it does become a little bit difficult to debug, which is why I advocate using helper methods. Don't put a lot of complexity in your macro. Put the complexity in the helper method uh, and just call the helper method and pass the arguments in uh, from the preprocessor. Yeah, and that makes it a lot easier to debug. I noticed you're passing some stuff into um, NS localized string. Yes. When you, when you run gen strings, does the preprocessor still get taken into consideration? I don't know. Not sure about that. <laughs> um, I imagine gen strings is probably just looking for the string yeah. in the source file, so it probably works. But it won't know about any of the <coughs> preprocess like in your def file. Um, so yeah, you're kind of up to you to copy and paste those into your strings file. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Cool. Thanks. Cool. Thanks. Yeah.